आने का नीचे होगा ऑडियो ऑडियो बंद करना चाहिए गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन ओके ओके चलो चलो हो चलो चलो ओके ओके बाय थैंक यू भैया ने आ गया 17 बजे 18 बजे बात हो रहा है सिटी गुड मॉर्निंग श्रीधर जी Can you hear me, Mr. Sahu, Dr. Sahu? Hello. Yes, sir. All uh, panelists are uh, unmuted. Yeah. yeah. Rester on mute. Okay. Yeah. You can hear us, right? Yeah. So.
another two minutes you will start them हाँ सर आपका या हाँ या या आई विल आई विल मेक अन्यू सर आई एम जस्ट ओके जस्ट ए सेकेंड ना Thank you. Uh, Garsab, uh, you are able to hear? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Oh. हाँ यस सर यू आर अनम्यूटेड ना यस सर सर हाँ या या इट इज़ नॉट अनम्यूटेड ओके सर जस्ट सेकंड सर जस्ट सेकंड Good morning, Dr. Shahu. Yeah, yes, sir. Just we will start one second, sir. Good morning, Mr. Kulkarni. Morning, sir. Morning. Good How are you, sir? I am doing good, sir. Ah. Uh, uh, Anis, please track uh, all speakers uh, that uh, uh, mute and unmute because if they mute again, they need to get permission. So you track them and just make them. Ah, uh, ah, uh, I will keep doing that. Okay. Right. Oh. Really? What a mistake! Okay. 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 So we'll start. Uh, it's twelve noon. A very, very good afternoon to. all the participants and uh, our eminent uh, uh, elite speakers uh, today the topic is uh, very very relevant and very important uh, you know these are uh, the people they are not in our direct roles but if they are not there no industry no economy everywhere the problem is there for that today uh, we have invited eminent uh, speakers so we will start with this uh, our uh, honorable national president mr mr uh, kulkarni uh, kulkarni sir i will uh, request you kindly give the inaugural address after that uh, we will proceed uh, with the panel discussion and uh, question answer session i will uh, one by one answer. i request uh, mr kulkarni sir to kindly give in address good afternoon all on behalf of nipm i welcome you all for yet another exclusive session organized webinar organized by nipm with the burning issue of migrant workers today we have a learned speakers panel members who are deeply involved in this subject and will guide us and show the way to overcome this challenge of migrant worker Mr Manish Kumar managing director and CEO NSDC Dr C Jay Kumar VP head HR CHR LNT Professor Biju Walke I am Ahmedabad 
Mr. Vinay Kumar Gurg, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court, our Honorable General Secretary, Dr. P.K. Sahu, and our Regional Vice President North, Dr. Mitra, S.B. Mitra. Just to set a tone of today's webinar, we all know turmoil caused by pandemic has resulted in not only millions of workers moving back to the hinterland, the issue of this reverse migration is not restricted related to interstate, intrastate, but it is interstate also. As per the present statistics, more than 50 lakhs migrant workers have gone back to their native place. More surprisingly, out of this, around 40% belongs to the Uttar Pradesh and around 35% belongs to the Bihar. So overall, around 75% migrant workers belong to this two state only. In today's speech in Man Ki Baat also, Honorable Prime Minister has suggested to have a commission, national, national Migration Worker Commission. With this, I, took, I look forward to have a great learning and knowledge sharing session. I am sure we all will have, have a key takeaway from today's webinar. Once again, thanking you, Dr. Sahu, for coordinating and organizing this wonderful webinar. Wishing you a great learning. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, dear participants, now uh, I will introduce the eminent uh, speakers. And after the introduction, our moderator, Dr. S.B. Mitra, he will uh, take over that. And I request you all to uh, put the questions in the chat box. And we will uh, try to uh, cover all the questions. And uh, uh, maybe if the time permits, I will unmute uh, the question, uh, the participant, to put it to the uh, panelists uh, directly. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Manish Kumar, sir. He is Managing Director and uh, Chief Executive Officer of National Skill Development Corporation. Prior to joining the NSDC, he worked for the World Bank as Country Coordinator and Senior Institutional Development Economist, Water and Sanitation Program. He also worked for the World Bank in Middle East and North African countries covering Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Egypt. Manish served in the Indian Administrative Service, occupying various positions in government of Tripura up to 2011. During his tenure in Tripura, he conceptualized and executed economic development programs for counterinsurgency insurgency, and was selected as a Mason Fellow by Harvard University for his leadership in empowering tribal women. Manish holds a degree in a Bachelor of Technology in Mining Machinery from IIT, that is called ISM number today, a Master in Public Administration from Harvard University, USA, and PhD in Public Policy from the George Washington University, Washington DC, USA. I request Manish Saab to greet the participants. Hello, thank you for your generous introduction. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, I have a great pleasure in introducing Dr. C. Jay Kumar, Vice President and Head Corporate Human Resources, Larson and Tibro Company, a well-known company across the globe. A highly result-oriented HR professional with 32 years of experience in engineering construction industry with proven experience in successfully planning, designing, implementing, and managing all strategic HR initiatives. He has varied experiences in every sphere. Currently, he is grappled mostly with the difficulties arised out of present this uh, migrant workers issue. So he will give a good insight to us. He has a bachelor's degree in economics from uh, University of Madras. His master's uh, in arts and labor studies from Madurai Kamraj University, University of Madras. And uh, he has executive diploma in HR, HRM, XLRI from Jamshedpur. PhD in the area of leadership from Madras School of Social Works, University of Madras. A lot of a very well certified uh, professional in qualified and accredited administrator of MBTI suit of instruments, Balvin team role acquisitions, uh, and leadership programs from state of the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's fine, sir. So, uh, 
I, 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 I request uh, Jack Marsa to greet the participants. So, so good afternoon. Nice you. to be a part yes. of this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's a great honor to introduce you all participants. Professor uh, Bizu Bharke, he's from IIM Ahmedabad. He's a fellow in NIBM and master's, of, uh, master's from uh, Mahatma Gandhi University. He chairperson of EPGP program and member of executive education committee, I am Ahmedabad. He's uh, many board, uh, he's board member for many companies and uh, he has been invited by organizations including UPS, UPSC, Rajya Sabha, SBI, RBI as external expert in review committees and departmental selection. As an executive trainer, he has designed and taught in executive programs for managers and administrators in government, public sector, private sector, MNCs, and non-governmental organizations, both India and abroad. He serves as the India Research Coordinator for the Paycheck India Project, part of the Global Ways Indicator Project. Professor Bizuharki, please greet the uh, participants. Great, great to be with you and thanks for inviting me. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we are honored with uh, the kind presence of Mr. Vinay Kumar Garg. He's a senior advocate at the Honorable Supreme Court of India and the Honorable High Court of Delhi. He has been practicing in a wide array of subjects, including service, labor, commercial, corporate, and criminal law. He has been the counsel for state of Haryana before the Honorable Supreme Court for about three years. He has been associated with various public sector undertakings as well as state authorities, representing them in disputes pertaining to commercial, service, and administrative law. He has also been actively involved in various social and welfare causes, including organizations for eradication of leprosy and rehabilitation of persons affected therewith. And he has worked for marginal sections of society, migrant laborers as well. I request Dorsab to greet the participants. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, uh, yes. very much honored to be part of this panel, uh, in, including leaders from the industry and academia. Thank you very much for involving Thank me. You. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's the time to introduce our moderator, Dr. Subir Vikas Mitra. He's an MBA, LLM, and also holds a PhD in strategic human resource management and currently pursuing his second PhD in law on alternative dispute resolution mechanism. And he has authored numerous research papers and articles published in various reputed journals. Having overall experience of about 36 years, he is currently executive director of law and HR, heading legal and HR department of Gale India Limited, a Maharatma public sector undertaking. He's an ardent negotiator and expert in strategizing and dealing with trade unions, collectives for long-term settlements, resolution of IDs, and all. He has all exhibited strong leadership to lead the cross-functional team in every sphere. He's an associate member in the governing body of Indian Council for Arbitration under the aegis of FIKI. He's also a chairman of Legal Standing Committee comprising of the legal heads of CPSCs for legal matters and member of steering committee on RTA in scope. Conferred with fellowship of NIPM, he is uh, instrumental in obtaining gold trophy citation of scope meritors award or RTA from president of India. He's one of the most sought after speakers in the areas of dispute resolution. And he has been featured twice in the top maiden general counsel power list for India, published by Legal 500 leading global legal directory for the years 2016 and 18 also awarded iccs excellence award for the year 2019 and featured in trailblazers a publication of country's finest in-house councils compiled by icca ladies and gentlemen please welcome this uh, great uh, uh, panelists and we are very very sure we will go away with the kind of input we need to deal with our industrial situation, which is around due to this COVID-19, about 53% down in economy. And uh, definitely we need to, there will be a great debate and discussion, maybe whether migrants or whether they will go back or they will stay at the place, what can government do, everything, all aspects will be dealt with. Please do not forget to put your questions in the chat code in advance so that it can be compiled and uh, Directed for the effective time management. Over to Dr. S. V. Mitra. Mitra sir, please. Uh, 
डॉक्टर एस बी मित्रा लास्ट हिम जस्ट ए सेकेंड थैंक्स डॉक्टर शाहू रेस्पेक्टेड नेशनल प्रेसिडेंट नेशनल काउंसिल मेंबर्स फ्रेंड्स फ्रॉम द लीगल एंड एच आर फैटर्निटी गुड गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल uh tony has already been said by uh, our national president and uh, dr shahu as well uh as you all know that the the covid crisis is deepening now and its impact on the economy and the business is likely to be very very severe uh the extent of impact will depend upon the nature of industry and the It will also vary from company to company, depending upon its preparedness. But in the recent past, that the subject issue of migrant workers has gained considerable momentum. It's a socio-economic and political issue as well. It's a very sensitive issue, and it has aggravated the whole subject to the <coughs> core. so uh, we are very happy that you know uh, we have got a eminent speaker to speak on the subject as a moderator i have been given the assignment to frame issues for the speakers to speak on the subject so i have decided to divide into two parts the first phase would like to cover the conceptual note the reasons justifiable reasons and the subject matter itself the second phase would like to speak on the actionable points the possible remedial measures and the preparedness of the industry and the government to overcome the crisis to begin with i would like to start with dr manish kumar he does not require any further introduction and he is from the government being an is officer would like to learn from the horse's mouth dr manish that the migrant worker and it the subject issue is recognized not now it is since long several legislations have also have come into play and way back in 2006 even ilo has come up with the guiding principles of course the uh, unbind you know, non binding guiding principles it revolves around the two issues mainly that decent work agenda for the migrant worker and it and their family members to meet the social economic and secondly more importantly that all the key principles are equally applicable for the migrant worker i don't want to get into those issues i would make a request to sir if you can come up that the governments thought about it what are those key human rights principles captured by the government and secondly mm. the most importantly that nsdc that generally deals with mapping of the skill set because industry open complex that we have got manpower but not in terms of the proper skill sets so how do you plan to map those skill sets and make it easier on the part of the industry to tap them whenever they are in need of such skill set over to dr monik thank you thank you very much uh, 
before I get to the question, I think I just would like to um, give a bit of profile of what, what are we dealing with in terms of uh, problems that we have. Uh, two, two aspects, one that I would like to emphasize. If you look at India and, the, and break it up into income quartiles, and we have four income quartiles, the lowest income quartile consists of people who earn 26,000 rupees per month and less. And most of the migrant worker would actually fall in this category, 26,000 rupees per month and less. Uh, you might be interested in knowing the other quartiles. So the second quartile is actually 26,000 to 37,000. And next one is 37,000 to 58,000. Anybody earns above 58,000 per month is the top 25% in India, the top 25% in terms of income. Anybody who earns more than 88,000 is actually top 10%. And I think all of us out here might be belonging to that top 10% of India's income quartile or income decile in a way. So this is just to lay the context of what we are dealing with. We are dealing with um, you know, uh, extremely, I think, uh, underprivileged people. Um, I'll come to a little later on what we are doing. Second thing I think we have to realize, 1.3 billion population that we have is equal to the population of the entire continent of Africa, which is 40 countries. So that's the magnitude of our problem in a way. And, uh, and therefore, when we begin to analyze and begin to, you know, in a way, try to understand that how the government is functioning, we need to understand we are, we are I mean, managing a huge, huge, huge problem. So I'm not a, a spokesperson for the government directly on this issue, but I do have insights onto things which uh, happen and which uh, a lot of thought which is being applied. Now, coming to the specifics, if you look at uh, the current context, uh, of uh, migrant uh, uh, return, uh, India has traditionally had few economic uh, zones where economic activities have been extremely high. We map, every, we map with the help of CMIE, uh, different places in India which has more than a crore of investments. And we have found that Maharashtra is the one where you get the highest level of investments. Then of course you have Gujarat, we have Karnataka, we have Tamil Nadu. So therefore a lot of jobs actually are created in these areas. And uh, the, the migration therefore occurs from north to the south for, for, for that purpose, for that reason. Delhi is another economic zone, by the way, which is uh, you know, a very powerful magnet for attracting migrant worker. So therefore, when this um, migration occurred, it's mostly occurred, as you will notice, uh, towards UP, Bihar. Uh, government of India has identified 90 districts, 90 districts across uh, states which are uh, which are essentially UP, Bihar, we spoke about that during the introduction, Odisha, uh, you have uh, Madhya Pradesh, and uh, we have uh, West Bengal. So these are the states in which about 90 districts have been identified. And uh, the plan is, uh, there are several uh, line of thinking on, on the planning of it. Uh, one of the plan is uh, to uh, uh, essentially to think about localizing the, um, the economy out there, that how do you ensure uh, skills that they have could be used locally. So first thing we are doing is mapping out the skills of people there. So a format which we have prepared and we are with the help of district collectors and also maybe CSC, we are in discussion with the uh, CSC who have got networks across villages. Um, the idea is that can we get the information about where they're coming from, how many years of experience they have and how much were they earning. So some basic information that allows us to understand and then connect them to local industry or local context. Now, when I say local industry, there are two, three ways of thinking about it. Uh, one is that many of them might be skilled, but may not be certified. So we should give them a certification because we do what we call recognition of prior learning and certify them because it's our experience that those people whom you, whom you certify after doing the recognition of prior learning module usually end up becoming much more empowered because their ability to get jobs and also understand where all they might fit in terms of their competencies that becomes broader. So it's not just in that one area where he traditionally has worked. So he could be actually fit for multiple things and that understanding becomes deeper. So RPL, recognition of prior learning is one of the things which uh, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship has proposed to take up. The second thing which is proposed is short term trainings to, to build their competencies towards things which might be locally relevant and something which might be of interest to them. So therefore there is a change in the job that they're doing but you're connecting them to locally relevant thing through a short term training. So that's uh, the second thing which is being done. A third thing where uh, I think a lot of uh, um, 
I think philanthropists and uh, you know, gen citizens and community support is needed, uh, I, I think would be entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is something which has been, uh, which has, which has not been our biggest forte so far. We have been, we are focused on skilling and then connecting to jobs. But the idea is, can we actually encourage people to become entrepreneurial? And when I say entrepreneurial, I mean nano entrepreneur, people who are entrepreneur with a capital of fifty thousand to one lakh rupee, and they use that for doing a business which is local and contextual. And uh, there are actually examples, very good examples in Odisha led by Mr. Subrat Bakshi, uh, which has done pretty well, actually, on, on uh, nano-entrepreneur, he call it, calls it nano-unicorns. So therefore, I, I think we need to move towards venture capital funds, social venture capital funds, you know, and uh, how, how we create um, capital, which can take risk, because government's capital obviously can, has limits of taking risk. You know, there are, there are various constraints within which the government's ca capital works. So, Given that, for nano entrepreneur, where the risk of failure is high, uh, how do you go there? And uh, we have some ideas on that. We are working on that too. So that's another thing which we are pushing on. In addition to all of these, we have called what we call skill management information system that we have developed along with Better Place. Uh, this is um, a Bangalore-based organization, um, private sector, which essentially matches the demand side that we'll feed in with the, uh, the supply side that we feed in of the migrant worker with the demand side which is essentially jobs that is rising across different parts of India. And uh, the idea would be to using artificial intelligence at the back end uh, to find out what is the nearest location where they will get the type of job which is suitable for them. So they need not travel all the way from Assam to Bangalore. If there is something which is nearer, maybe in Siliguri or Calcutta. So the idea is use that uh, to, to get them a job which is nearer to their home place. So this, and that is ready. That platform is actually ready and uh, is being tried out already. So the idea would be that can we work on all of these? And uh, I think the, uh, the earlier part of the question was about the legal aspects of labor laws. Uh, I think most of the state governments have uh, you know, good understanding of labor. They, are, they have labor departments. I don't have very deep insights on the labor part of it because I'm focused more on skills, but I'm aware that uh, there is a continuous uh, evaluation which occurs within government to understand uh, how, how they could be helped and various security measures which are often taken within the constraints of government's finance in trying to reach out to them and help them. Uh, so the, the hope is, and as you can even see, uh, even the current direction that we have got, as well as many other ministries uh, have got, uh, is to focus on the migrant worker and ensure that the most underprivileged are the ones uh, who are given attention during this difficult time. So broadly speaking, uh, I think there is a lot of sensitivity towards this issue and uh, everybody is working hard uh, towards that. End. And I think it needs support, not just uh, not just from the, the government, but actually the community has to get mobilized. And uh, you'll notice this in many countries across the world, where government is very heavily supported by community community organizations. And that's what makes it much more powerful and deep-rooted. So I think that's what we should look for here too. Thank you. This is, I think, uh, the initial remarks which I would like to make. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manish. Uh, now we'll move so uh, we'll come back to Dr. Monish again, uh, but now I will move to Dr. C. J. Kumar. He is from Larson and Tubro. And I would like to understand from uh, Dr. J. Kumar, uh, can, can he come up an in-depth analysis of justifiable reason for migrant workers to leave the workplace and moving towards their you know, hometown? and how it is likely to impact the industry at large, and more particularly, the industry belongs, that is the real estate and the construction sector. Dr. Uh, uh, Jai Kumar, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mantra. At the outset, let me thank NIPM for this great opportunity to be a part of the panel along with uh, learned people, Supreme Court advocates, IAS officers, and, uh, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, to begin with, even before I get into the migrant workman, the, the whole economy is under going through a turbulence, right? It is unprecedented. None of us sitting here would have ever thought in the month of January that we'll be going through such a turbulence, right? So, uh, some industries are terribly affected, like uh, tourism, aviation, and hospitality. 
including construction. Some of the industries are uh, little affected. But uh, on the whole, everybody is struggling through. Uh, main uh, factor is either they have lost two to two and a half months of your know, activity, whether it is production, it is construction, it is manufacturing, whatever it is, because of this lockdown and social distancing and other things, we have lost the thing. So there is a effect in the revenue. So we have to catch up this. So every company is struggling with either a cost issue or a cash, cash flow issue. So now slowly when the unlocking is starting up, we have to mobilize the workforce, mobilize the staff and engineers. And to catch up this time, this two and a half months, which you have lost, you have to catch up in the balance uh, nine months. So you need more people or you have to increase productivity or you have to increase technology to, to catch up these things, to stay where you are at least, not uh, at least to grow. Uh, in this aspect, uh, some industry, especially construction, employs a lot of uh, workers from other states, either you call it migrant workmen or you call it guest workmen who come from the other states. Yes, uh, there are... And uh, you have seen in the media, you have seen in the, in the newspaper reports and you have seen various things, people are migrating. It's a fact, people went back to their places. Uh, when I look at it from the lens of an employer, uh, there are two sectors. What is organized sector? It's an unorganized sector. In an organized sector, companies like us, we, we, in, uh, we have very, very clearly taken care of the government guidelines, made SOPs, we have ensured uh, the full protection, health, safety concerns of the workmen. The entire uh, the labor camp was sanitized and we have regular visits of doctors and full safety is taken care of and that even the workman knows. And we have also taken care of the food, food and their, uh, all their needs is taken care of within the campus. Uh, in fact, even the government missionary has helped. In fact, in our airport job, the, the deputy chief labor commissioner used to regularly interact and ensure that the workers are all getting the record, the government has also done their effort. But psychologically, when I look at it, uh, even the workmen are looking at the newspapers, etc. Most of the migrant workmen or the guest workmen who come, or come as a bachelors. Their families are in different places. UP, Bihar, Bengal, in different locations throughout the country, wherever it is. So the, the, the families are also looking at those news. They are also looking at this. Actually, definitely there's a fear, right? Everybody, whether, whatever it is, their uh, husband is very important, their father is important. So there is a lot of pressure from the from the native itself asking them to come back. Enough, whatever you have earned, chalo, aja, wapas, aja, agar. So that is the type of pressure the workman also get. It is quite natural, even if you and me are in a different location, that's quite natural that we get this type of a pressure. And second thing is, they also had an always, I'm not talking about the unorganized. Uh, uh, places, uh, we, we have to define uh, again what is organized, what is unorganized. I'm talking about a company which uh, we have given all facility. They've been paid wages also as per the government direction. So they have two months of wages, two and a half months of wages in hand. In a normal course, they would have spent half, they would have already sent to the native, they would have used for our food expenses. And so they even wait for some amount to accumulate to go back home. Today, they have two and a half months salary also in my hand. There is a pressure from uh, family to come back. There is a fear and anxiety there. With all these things, quite natural people tend to move towards the net. But now the challenge of the private sector or the manufacturing sector is to how do we mobilize them back when the things become normal? Is it enough to handle the force with the existing people or with from the people within the state? Definitely, it may not be possible. If you see construction, two years together, if you see, there are very clearly, you can say, if you look at uh, shuttering, reinforcement, it is West Bengal, Bihar, and etc. If you look at masonry, that type of work, it is from there. If you want heavy rigor, it is from Punjab. There is some high scale carpenter, the uh, finishing carpenters, that type of people, which from Himachal. So there are certain builders, some skilled work on mechanics, and all from Kerala. So there are different uh, things. So now the, the challenge is how we uh, ensure, uh, motivate them to come back and restart the work in taking care of their social security, taking care of their health, taking care of all those things as a responsible corporate citizen. That is our biggest challenge today. We are looking at various ways and means to see that uh, how we ensure the health and safety of the workmen, get them back and look at uh, working towards the nation building activities. We do most of the major projects in India and abroad. 
uh, that is uh, setting the context further uh, as it goes by i will share my views thanks Uh, thank you, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, um, J. Kumar. Now we'll move to uh, Professor Professor Jabiju Virki. He is a he's professor from a very esteemed and sought after institutions, IIM Ahmedabad. Sir, would like to understand. Uh, you need to you know uh, highlights the issues particularly from the perspective of supply chain, people supply chain perspective, because migrant workers form the part of the unorganized sectors, as Mr. J. Kumar also mentioned, and that constitutes 90% of the 500 million workforce. So how do you look at it, this, you know, the, the gap that industry is likely to face. And second part, that how do you propose and what are the challenges to bring them back? Thank you so much, Dr. Biju. Great. Thank you, Mithaji. And thank you for it's a pleasure to be here among the uh, learned audience. And I see some. Uh, good friends uh, faces and uh, good, uh, good friends also attending this. Let me just uh, take you from a, uh, you know, suddenly the discourse on migrant labor is has come to the forefront. Okay, and that discourse uh, has its own issues is because I think from a journalistic perspective, unless you show a particular uh, what you call uh, a facade of it or a particular narrative okay i think we will not watch tvs so <laughs> or uh, so what we actually get to know is that look you know suddenly it has actually become a problem suddenly it is something uh, which has actually come and now it has also become a big more uh, bigger issue is that now when the unlocking has started then how do you actually but you know <laughs> Ever, ever, and my, but if you look at historically, migrate the world was built through migration. Okay, that it's not that. And I am a migrant. I'm a migrant to the state of Gujarat. And I'm proudly say that, look, I am a migrant. And I'm sure many of you sitting in this audience are also technically migrants. Okay, but then suddenly, you know, you talked about a particular class of a person who possibly walks, who wears flat sandals, and then has a harassed hara, hara face, engaged in non technical type of or low skilled work, etc., are concerned as migrants. No, there, there are an old set of actually migrants and organizations, a nation has to be worried about it, but rightfully has actually said that 90% of them belong to this large chunk of the informal sector which uh, has formed the backbone of our nation building and even the world building. Now, how do you actually do that? And if you also look at it, Indian Indians as a migrant class has been one of the largest migrant class around the world because this is one country which uh, eight, $80 billion is actually one of our, what do you call, is our annual remittance which actually comes from uh, international migration. Now here, suddenly the focus also has come to uh, uh, in, uh, interstate migration and another factor which we have forgotten is also intrastate migrations because I understand, you know, in some of the states, intrastate migration is also an equally challenging problem. Okay, why has it become a problem? Because fundamentally, if it is a you know universal phenomenon, why it has become a problem is because we have three issues. One is we have an issue of actually conceptualization of understanding that look, who is this migrant and uh, why does he go? Where does he come from? Uh, he or she. You know, this old government. So conceptualizing of it has been a problem because we, in a way, uh, sorry to say that we ignored it. The second is actually giving them an identity and a definition. You know, that is where I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Vinay Garg will educate, would talk about it is that we have the Interstate Migrant Act, we have a certain Construction Labor Act, we have certain acts which actually include some people, but in the, uh, in the process become silent about a, a larger majority. Okay, so we have a problem of actually creating an identity. I remember attending an I ILO conference where uh, 
uh, one of the labor minister ministry officials of uh, uh, in uh, one of the i think it was indonesia who actually said is that uh, because there was a lot of uh, you know negative narrative against the platform firms like ola etc they are exploitative they are all this thing but somewhere down the line this labor ministry officer was actually telling is that if ola is able to give a telephone number and a license and uh, you know and create some sort of a uh, what you call pathway to reach that driver who, who otherwise you don't even know is unrecorded drivers driving something somewhere okay isn't actually all are doing all or what you call uber doing a better work in terms of an identity creation so we we unfortunately though we have systems of uh, which can helps us to create identity uh, you know we have not doing that and nsdc etc are doing great games in the in the in the in that area of actually creating value to that identity that i am really skilled i am really doing it and the third one is the old data you know how do you really kept the data of the migrants in fact the definition of you know migrants is that they are generally when you actually said that the poor uh, informal sector migrants is that they are unseen populations i see the narrative in some of the regional language newspapers which i read suddenly there is a migrant unrest the middle class a lot of people are surprised wow so many migrant people in our backyard because you know they are actually uh, what do you call uh, uh, you know in the fringes they are silent they are they are not identif uh, identified you don't see them they are invisible okay but suddenly you have become actually visible and that visible this thing is bringing up a focus of the focus to them and there is somewhere where i have to have the you know put the narrative correct is that it's not that every intra interstate of interstate migrant has gone back it's not that you know at least in certain cases there are also migrants who have actually chosen to stay back okay and there are also organizations which are actually doing very positive work in terms of uh, helping them to stay back lnt is one of the organization i'm sure your um, uh, dr jay kumar can share about it they are actually doing you know a lot of work in terms of helping them to actually stay back so we should not actually ignore the fact that uh, that we have the interstate migrants you know everybody is going back and everyone is okay but a good section of those people have actually gone back but unfortunately we really don't have data uh, anything to actually say that you know what sort of people have gone back what sort of people have stayed back etc you know these are all thing, you know, you know uh, data points which need to be uh, you know brought out and which need to be planned okay so let me actually say that why are we looking at the so called migrant labor okay the migrant labor fundamentally comes you know is that they take care of a demand supply gap that's what mr manish kumar was telling that's where you always actually find from the north in the indian context you will find from the north to the south okay so there are donor states and there are recipient states and one natural case of particularly the informal migrants in india is that this is some sort of a circular migration which had created its own pattern so they come okay and then during maybe the harvest season or there is some season they a large number of them go back but then they go back in a distributed fashion they go back uh, and there is a pattern to it and the system the industry etc had adjusted to that actually the pattern so there is a demand supply match which is done okay and now why industry or organizations are worried is that this untimely pandemic which caught us is going to hurt that demand supply balance and that is going to be hurtful and one one of the major reasons and which in india and the second one is that possibly the experiences of this circular migration at this point of time possibly extremely traumatic for a large number of people they might actually choose not to actually come back okay so there there is a risk associated there the second one is that migration also what looking at we need at skills okay so there were pockets in india where, where there were skills available and people actually looked into pockets in terms of locating industries or hiring people okay which is a fun, to me this is a fundamental flaw in terms of our workforce planning is that if you say that if you want carpenters we go only there if you want this we go there if you want nurses you only go there. 
Okay, of course, there is labor market conducive, labor market or labor market fluidity, as it's called as the ease of hiring. Uh, it's better over there, but then, uh, you know, the, there is a much more policy challenge for organizations to actually look at it. The third one is actually cost. Okay, the, though, you know, at least uh, in some cases, people who have worked out the cost of migrations and the cost of handling the migrant people, and in some states like Kerala, you know, the cost of the, the migrant, uh, uh, you, you know, is rather really very high. There is uh, what do you call it? the cost arbitrage which you are getting is pretty high but then the cost is another factor and then there are two factors which are actually uh, you know which is actually a very very qualitative factor which also uh, the ease of managing okay because uh, migrant labor management generally because of the structure where people actually felt that it is easy to manage because there is a very very clear command and control system which has been established okay and now, maybe in this state, that, that ease of management is also going to actually disappear. And that is also becoming one of the challenges. But what have we forgotten in that? In the process, we have forgotten certain very, very important things. Okay, I'm talking about at a macro level. Individual organizations have addressed that, but I'm talking about NSDs is also doing a good job in it, but I think we need to do more about it. One is actually credentialing. Okay. Do we really know what the skills of this migrant labor are? And the answer in many cases is, unless in pockets, it's, uh, you know, it's no. Okay. How do you know, where do you, uh, where, where, where can you use this migrant labor? We don't actually know. The second one is that, how about productivity? Okay. Pro migrant labor productivity is something which I think uh, has not been really studied at all. We talk about volumes of work which possibly labor does okay uh, but then we really not talk, does not talk about the productivity and the quality of the work okay then uh, of course there is a saving financial prudence or, or the migrant labor's own quality of life okay how do you treat the migrant labor how do you actually handle migrant labor the quality of life of the migrant labor because they are also very very processed and the fourth one i would like to come back to it labor it's uh, when you're looking at it from a supply chain point of view my, a lot of my migrant laborers, there is actually what you call as a coordinator. Okay, that's the fundamental premise of a supply chain, the coordination and the visibility effect of it, who is actually called the labor contractor. Okay, unfortunately, what has happened is that the labor contractor has, has become the villain in this whole game. Okay, we rather not actually talk about this labor contractor. Okay, maybe at some stage in this audience, we would love to talk about is that how do you really talk about, you know, bringing in the labor contractor also, making the labor contractor visible in the supply chain is actually extremely important to actually. But then we are also forgetting that there is another category of migrant, which is also like international HRM, what you talk about, self-initiated exp expatriate. We actually talk about what you call as a self-initiated migrant, which actually there are certain industries, which is almost like 80, 90% made up of self-initiated migrants. They don't have a contractor who brings it, but a starry-eyed young boy or girl who possibly comes from a small town in UP, takes an unreserved compartment and reaches Bomb uh, Bombay uh, to become a Bollywood star is a self-initiated migrant. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Bijay. Okay. Thank we you so much, Dr. Bijay. We'll cover the second part uh, subsequently. Now, let's go back to Mr. Binay Garg. Uh, Mr. Binay Garg is a friend of mine and uh, he is a senior advocate, the dictated senior advocate from the Supreme Court of India, uh, deals with the labor matters, service matters, along with the commercial disputes matter. Now, once we get, uh, go to Mr. Binay Gar, as uh, Professor Biju rightly pointed out, that would like to cover the legal framework from Mr. Binay Gar. And once we say or talk about the legal framework, definitely would like to understand the constitutional mandate, the uh, part, uh, 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 more particularly from the directive principles perspective. And secondly, that this issue of migrant workers 
had been receiving attention of the government and the legislature and therefore several laws have come up over the passage of time for last 50 years uh, more and more industries they have moved uh, from recruiting the direct employees to the outsourced management and therefore you know to avoid exploitation the contract labor regulation abolition act 1970 was promulgated in fact everybody understand that outsourced management provide more efficacy and efficiency in the system and it is more cost effective most importantly you don't have to carry the baggage if you don't find him suitable for the given assignment so the second part that the subject issue of interstate migrant worker that interstate migrant workmen act also came into being in 1979 trigger was from which of course but it's a central legislation thirdly and most importantly we know that equal remuneration act that act suddenly you know uh, received attention of the supreme court because in most of the cases that outsourced employee they perform the similar nature of work and we don't pay them as payable to the regular workforce despite having the statute it was not being implemented effectively and after the 2006 that non-binding uh, uh, multilateral framework created by the ILO in 2008 Arunarai sector social security act also has come into place in 2008 and it has also not been you know effectively monitored and implemented I am not here to accuse anybody or to make a blame game but I would like to understand from uh, Mr. Binay Gar, what are those legal provisions to cover the interest and how do we propose to protect and safeguard the interest of the migrant workforce? Thank you. Over to uh, Mr. Binaigar. Thank you, Mr. Mitra. And um, uh, I have heard all the panel panelists who have spoken before me on uh, management and the uh, employer perspectives. But the, for speaking as a uh, advocate, as an advocate, uh, we must understand that legal framework uh, with regard to migrant labor. Initially, we did not have, we, we, we had not recognized migrant labor as migrant labor. And we had recognized them as, you know, the, some, someone employed in unorganized sector. And even the unorganized sector was not defined in uh, legal parlance. And it was known as something which is not organized. Okay. Now, the, this, um, we have uh, uh, part four of the Constitution of India, wherein articles 38, 39, 41, 43, and 43A specifically uh, uh, mandate the state to ensure welfare measures, to ensure equal pay for equal work for women and men. And also Article 43 specifically uh, mandates the government to ensure enough and uh, adequate legislative framework to, uh, to make decent standard of life available for the workmen, full of laser, uh, social and cultural opportunities. And, and then in uh, the recent amendment which was made in the constitution in 2011 that was uh, Article 43, capital A was inserted, which even talked of uh, securing participation of workers in management. But in spite of all these uh, constitutional framework, in spite of the uh, workers and the workers' uh, interest being uh, heavily loaded in the uh, legislative framework in the concurrent list uh, in entries 22 to 24, we hardly had any uh, uh, statutes which directly covered these workers in the unorganized sector till the second uh, planning commission noted it and the second planning commission thereafter made recommendations that yes there is a uh, problem of uh, at, at, at that time perceived 
the problem of contractors exploiting the uh, individual labors. So the uh, planning commission uh, recommended that we uh, uh, prohibit and uh, do away with this contract system. And wherever we cannot do it, then we should regulate it. And this is how, uh, from the report of uh, the National Labor Commission in 69, thereafter in 1970, we had uh, this uh, first act, namely the Contract Labor uh, Regulation and Abolition Act 1970. Now, if you see Contract Labor Regulation uh, Act, then that act specifically, the, it had three things. One, it applied only to those industries which engaged 20 or more workers. That's one. Second, it specifically excluded casual and intermittent nature of work where these migrant laborers, which we call them today, were or the unorganized sector workers, they were largely employed. Apart from that, the Contract Labor Regulation and uh, Management Act, this could not address the problems of the migrant labor to a large extent because there were certain shortcomings in the act to the extent its exclusions, as also that there was there was a lengthy and tedious process through which uh, contract labor system could have been abolished in a particular industry. Now, that is, uh, system of contract labor continued and in between in 1976 came the other act that is Equal Remuneration Act, which was confined only to ensure that equal remuneration in terms of article, uh, in terms of uh, the specific article 39 of the constitution of india namely remuneration to men and women were ensured but the first act and the first time the term migrant labor was used in a statute that was interstate migrant workers regulation and employment and condition service act 1979 as mr mitra just now mentioned but in this act if we see the uh, definition of migrant worker, the definition of migrant worker include only those workers who are taken by a contractor from one state to another state for employment. It does not include those workers who are self-initiated migrants, as Professor Varki just now mentioned. The self-initiated migrants are not covered by this act. They are not recognized as the migrant labor. Apart from that, this act talked of mapping of the migrant labor, registration, and uh, that a data shall be maintained with regard to the migrant labor. But that, to my uh, knowledge, so far has not been fully done. And that's how the large number of migrant labor, namely, who are in unorganized sector, who are not covered even by the Interstate Migrant Workers uh, Act, they are left out and they, they uh, constitute a sizable number. We are talking not in terms of thousands and lakhs, but in crores. When we talk, uh, we take the size of the population which we have in India and the population of the uh, the entire population of the workers and the migrant workers, which uh, we take into consideration. Now, these problems, these problems in spite of our constitutional mandate have been existing. And these problems have become much more relevant and much more apparent and uh, they are right in front of all of us, industry, legislature, uh, judiciary as also the uh, uh, government as to how to ensure that these labor, these uh, uh, citizens who are who are left unregulated, though they they have a large uh, contribution in these uh, in the economy and the economic activities of the country but they have been left unregulated. So this is a problem which has come before us and which need to be addressed, which I see as a law. Now, the last uh, act which actually recognized 
these migrant laborers is unorganized worker social security act and as mr mitra pointed out this act basically talked of constitution of three uh, 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 tier system one is national social security board state social security board and then worker facilitation centers now national security board uh, social security board as also state security uh, social security board if we see the provisions of the act they only are the recommendatory bodies their recommendations even for the welfare of these uh, unorganized sector workers are not binding and most of the recommendations mean made by these security uh, social security boards have so far remain unimplemented mm -hmm. the workers facilitation centers which were to be which were at the grass grassroots level uh, in the states and other areas have not come up and with the result that the the impact and the effect of the uh, legislation which the parliament enacted has not gone and has not percolated to the migrant laborers today just uh, just now professor varki uh, pointed out that not all the migrant laborers have migrated to their native places but yes it is correct that not all but a large number of them have migrated they may be tied up uh, to my mind to their social and uh, the rural environment and the rural uh, establishments for some time but in times to come they will have to come back and they will have to come back and again resume those activities which they had been doing in cities and towns and uh, all areas where we have industry and the economy and the commerce going on but still we do not today we have worked as uh, what the uh, plan, legislature what the uh, uh, executive has to see today is that how do we address these problems which we have seen because of this pandemic and because of this pandemic and the lockdown which we have come and which we have become uh, you know we, which we, which are available to, uh, uh, in public domain now that these are the problems which are faced by these migrant laborers some of the problems which i perceive are that they are generally paid poor and inadequate wages there is lack of implementation uh, of uh, safety measures and protection of laws towards them they have long and unregulated working hours women workers they encounter uh, many more difficulties in terms of uh, harassment at uh, workplace or somewhere so this may not be correct I, as uh, mr jay kumar pointed out that the large companies the companies of the size of lnt are taking care of their workmen who are organized workers as well as unorganized workers but the companies at the middle level and as a, at the small level and the establishments namely the shops and other establishments where uh, individual or uh, uh, these workers are working in small groups there these these uh, legal uh, uh, benefits have not permitted to them these Mr. Binan, yes uh, in fact you know bob uh, looking at the paucity of time because mm -hmm. we have to go to the quickly go to the second phase and then subsequently the question answer session yes. i would like to stop you here uh, or your last you know uh, 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 punch line if any my, my the, the i'll conclude my uh, first comment by by saying this that there are legal frameworks available in terms of these four uh, statutes which i just now pointed out to you there are enough legal frameworks available there are enough uh, directives available in the constitution of india but we need to do more for the migrant laborers for these uh, laborers who are largely in unorganized sector and uh, that we will have to do thank you thank you so much now very quickly we'll go for uh, go for the second phase uh, um, we'll again come back to dr manish kumar uh, sir you have already highlighted the different steps already undertaken by the government but today we
they keep on saying about that migration governance and that implicitly recognizes that migration is a phenomenon sir, sir your voice I, had uh, break i mean there was uh, you uh, again no, uh, reframe no. the question sir yes sir uh, you no know, people are talking about the migration governance and that implicitly recognizes that migration is a phenomena involving range of stakeholder and not not merely the union and the state but still would like to understand uh, very quickly from your side sir uh, can you please come up the highlights of the comprehensive policy government is expected to you know uh, undertake or uh, from the nsdc what are the steps being you know taken by you to mitigate this hardship thank you so much over to you sir dr manish yeah thank you thank you very much um so talking about uh, a, a full policy of the government i think i would not like to venture there i'll speak about what nsdc does and how that could help uh, in this kind of circumstance and firstly coming to the broader issue about uh, migration governance which you spoke about and various laws that have existed and the issue of uh, let's say those laws not being enforced over time so we becoming suddenly conscious of it and making a huge enforcement only when the crisis occurs i don't think so is the right way to go uh, we, the, the laws are meant to be enforced at all i think the ideal way would be that you should enforce the law when things are at its best because then the system has the capacity to absorb the shock which comes from it and there are people whose incentives are aligned to let's say low wages to labor and therefore you know the distortion that that occurs on account of it um so those those are challenges which we foresee you know and one of the thing which i feel that this this moment could also be an opportunity for labor uh, wages particularly because a lot of people have returned and the surplus which existed in in the many of the cities uh, has gone down so much that i am getting a repeated request from many of the industry that they would be willing to give a joining bonus for a blue collar worker so that's that's the level to which the market has gone now which is very very good you know and that's that's exactly what we should try and retain that the demand for labor should be such that you you are willing to pay higher wages and uh, i think unfortunately the though the productivity of india has been going up and you will find also that the gdp has been going up if you look at the real wages of labor it's been mostly flat or actually even going down at times so how do we how do we ensure that uh, this and this is a global phenomenon by the way and probably related to the the exponential i think tech expenditure people are making in technology uh, and therefore a lot of invest lot of money that they make in uh, industry actually being invested um, in more technology and not being shared with labor i think that's that's the uh i think dilemma we are in so one of the chances of for us to get this done is ensuring that the local employment opportunity increases more than it does now and uh, therefore we have identified about 100 economic clusters that exist within india uh and if we can begin focusing on these clusters and skilling as per these clusters so that uh the the local economy becomes uh, kind of the core uh, to which people get attracted rather than the economy which is too far away from them so i think that there is a need for therefore thinking very very local uh, in clusters not even states within clusters so even the interstate interstate migration we are talking of can be reduced through that method so i think that's that that looks like the way forward and uh, for us we we have uh, uh, in a way we have uh, started some plans on how we go about doing that and in the long term we'll map out that are we uh are we really ready for that kind of you know or, or do we need to add something more given all the infrastructure which we already have so that's the way we are looking at it at the moment thank you so much sir thank you so much now i'll go to dr uh, j kumar very quickly within 2 3 minutes can you please you know uh, talk about the labor reform that is being taken place in the interest of the industry and also mm -hmm. to attract ordinary investment and secondly labor being the uh, uh, subject concurrent sub no, uh, 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 subject of the union list and the state list the state is also different states uh, states have already you know uh, uh, gone for 
some kind of you know uh, suspension of the labor laws how it is going to help the migrant worker uh, at least for the construction sector and uh, even if we do not decide to decentralize our industrial hub thank you so much over to you jai kumar sir thank you thank you very much uh, before i go into that i concur with uh, professor biju that all of them have not left we have around 55 to 60% of our work workmen from other states still live with us uh, which we have started the work so with because of social distancing substantial amount of work is happening so we are at the looking at bringing back the balance bit and uh, interestingly uh, never i have seen in such a quick succession so much of amendment in the acts government has very promptly very proactively acted to uh, do lot of reforms in the short period how big we should not just as how big it is and all at least there is a intention to do right so if you take a provident fund uh, for msmes straight away three months of contribution of employer employee for 1500 payment i don't want to get into details but in pf there are a lot of reforms done right one is uh, uh, 12% to 10% brought down to improve the cash flow the, the enough time given for the remittances no penal provision is done same way in ess i see when the unlocking started the working hours in factory many of the states if you say gujarat himachal rajasthan haryana assam goa mp all mm -hmm. states have increased the spread of the working hours from 9 hours to 12 hours spread over is increased over time uh, yes most of the states is, it's continued to be the double one or two states went for a single over time immediately reverted back in the interest of the, the interest of the people but quite interestingly some amendments which has come in mp and up are little uh, very 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 radical uh, uh, but for uh, uh, though it is only an ordinance uh, making many of the acts in, uh, inactive and but when you go deep inside that the core provisions have been kept if you say minimum wages act payment of wages act equal term rate all of one but they say minimum wages to be ensured to be paid payment to be wages to be paid on time if you take a minimum wages act what are the core of the minimum wages is the, the minimum amount of wages to be paid to the workman that is retired if you take a payment of wages act other than the payment of wages and timely payment balance all or other maybe authorized so the core essence have been kept lot of effort have kept on health safety of the workman is taken care of the women employees have taken care of equal remuneration is taken care of so the core has been kept but many other things have been uh, left out like industrial disputes act other whole lot of acts have been uh, said it is but we have to wait and watch how it evolves but as an employer quickly comes to my mind as even as a public sector you will think if contract labor abolition uh, regulation abolition act has become is removed then what happens to the contract labor is it is it is it becomes the the uh, directly to the principal employer at the same time there is some other side if you see industrial disputes act has gone then there's a provision there's no provision for retrenchment lockdown uh, 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 closure etc so it is a free economy is are we moving are we prepared are we ready it's a very very radical thought if you look at if the demand and supply of labor is equal then the equilibrium will set in and with the bargaining power of the workman will go up and it will set in but that is one one uh, 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 question mark which which has to evolve but then we have to get a deeper understanding of uh, the you know, the how uh, how the, the further goes on because and very recently there was also an announcement that there will be permission to be got from the government for this it's it's yet to be we have to understand what are the provisions and that because there are certain constitutional uh, thing but anybody can go anywhere and work the see equality of work equality of pay and other constitutional provisions which uh, our advocate can talk much about that more Thank than that, what i if it a positive time i will stop otherwise i would like to make a point more than what government has done for us uh, what they have done as john kennedy said uh, don't ask what country has done what you have done as a corporate citizen we have invested lot in skill development of migrant work we are closely working in nstc uh, and in fact uh, our ex group group our group chairman is the chairman of nsdc now lot of our people have been in the nsdc Uh, we have construction skills training institutes across the state uh, and we have different uh, uh, trades we are training people and they are put back into the employment after a period of time we again we bring back them for next level of training to so sixth level of training from an one 10 standard fail person onwards if it is uneducated from there we 
take them till the level of supervisor at a six levels of training. So uh, enough have been done in this area, and but the demand is still going up. We need people. The 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 not only our company, many of the companies are investing in skill training. So in the future. Uh, both the demand and supply will take care of the equilibrium of the payment of wages, etc. Then bringing in a regulation of employment between here, but we have to ensure that the basic necessities thank of the. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jay Kumar. In fact, you have thank you speak much for the time too, and uh, we'll have more opportunities to interact with the you know uh, the participant with the participants. Now we'll go back to Professor Biju, sir. You know we are, you have uh, covered most of the important issues. But one, you know, uh, the theme that is, you know, uh, doing around that is non-migratory rural employment. This is one issue. And uh, how do you look at it? Whether it is a feasible proposition? And the second issue that often comes to our mind, as you very rightly pointed out, contractors are by and large villain. They generally exploit the contract labor. And how do you propose to create a very responsible partnership or a collaborative partnership with the contractor. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Professor Biju. One second, one second. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was muted. Sorry. A great talk. Come back again. I would like to have, apart from addressing these two points, I also want to address one actual point is that a lot of times why, why we take contract labor, why we take migrant labor is the fact is that we actually believe that we don't want a baggage. But I want industry to actually to examine the fact is that we are getting into industry 4.0. Where robotics, where artificial intelligence, IoT, etc., are going to done. For example, like I remember in Vargi sir is there. I remember in one of those uh, discourses uh, uh, in Kuchin Shipyard, you know, with uh, what he called 3D printing, one day we will print out uh, a ship. And that's a reality which is going to come. Okay. And now with the same, you know, if we consider our workers, which are going to last. Uh, what you call as a baggage, you have an actual pro uh, you know, problem in hands. In fact, a lot of organizations actually are contracting workers also, even if they are as uh, skilled, uh, what you call migrant workers, they are contact, uh, you know, considering the, the discourse or the perspective is changing is because you know, their contribution is actually much, much more critical. Okay, they are all, all slowly erring on the side of a knowledge worker, not all, but a good number of them. Just their point for them. The second one is that, yes, India had this old framework of non-migratory localized employment. Okay, every state, and unfortunately, it was mostly in the private sector. Okay, large ones, uh, I can name one of the organizations which I am very, very proud of is the Amar Raja batteries in Tirupati, Karikampadi, etc., which, you know, produces maybe one of the largest battery companies in this part of the globe. Okay fundamentally purely run on non-migratory rural employment. You know, what does industry require? Industry requires roads, power, and connectivity. If possibly through our public intervention, we are able to actually create industry, take it away from cities and locate it. Yes, non-migratory rural employment and organizations like NSDC have a large, uh, what you call, plan to do. Yes, construction and other things where people move from project to project need to have a you know, separate model, okay? And the third one of, you know, city-centric uh, services or a city-centric production and services would have to have a th third model. In fact, we are talking about, when you're talking about, we are talking about integration of actually uh, th three models together to look into it. Unfortunately, the discourse has suddenly gone back to actually looking at only one model. That they have gone back, let's bring them back and bring them back to the same circumstances, okay? But we need possibly at least there are points in which government of india is thinking that's actually very good i think industry also should actively think about it uh, and another one which i want is actually to really talk about is about the labor contractor okay as a business partner 
you know, our suppliers are our business partners. We work a lot with our vendor development teams, etc. Why not possibly working with these labor contractors in terms of making them as a business partner and uh, having proactive, uh, you know, proactive engagement with them rather than giving them uh, shadow treatment or allowing them to exploit. That is where the decent work discourse comes. And the decent work discourse of uh, what you call on labor, uh, okay, migrant labor is global. And in India also, if you look at the United Nations and the ILO and the Ministry of Labor's web pages, the six points of the decent work conditions are there. I will just read it out. Number one is that please help the worker to make informed choices. There should not be any force on the worker to come or stay back. You are not treating with bond and death. Second one is that protect human rights and worker rights at source, destination, and during transit, because it's a la larger chain. The third one is that, yeah, the protect the worker. Uh, the fourth one is that reduce the cost of labor migration. In fact, if you really look at it, we had done for international organization of migration, the supply chain from which was part of the Abu Dhabi dialogue. In fact, our report has been verbatim accepted in that. In fact, the cost of migration of a migrant from India to the Middle East is exorbitant. Okay, the cost of the migrant, what the migrant really uh, incurs is something which needs to be reduced. There will be a cost of it. Then that is where regulate the so-called labor contractors. Okay, but then, you know, we need to actually look at it from a very perspective. Front. Then the fourth one is that the migrant labor's agenda should be part of industry planning, should be part of area planning, should be part of any city or regional or rural planning. We have not actually factored in this migrant movements into any of the spatial planning exercises. That is where people from Bangalore hate me for telling it is that Bangalore has suddenly become an overgrown village. Okay, is because we have failed to integrate that. That integration is extremely important to provide them with uh, labor, uh, what you call decent work conditions. And the last one, which is most important, is the public perception of these migrant labors. In fact, all said and done, we want migrant laborers to clean our toilets, to make our city functions, but we don't want to see them. Unfortunately, that's a social ill. Okay, and unless that public perception, I'm proud that Kerala has actually said is that we, have, we will never call them interstate workmen or we will call them as guest workers. You know, they are the guests. Okay, and the partnership is more about a mindset is more about a discourse. Okay, that's what I wanted to actually uh, talk and uh, stop here before we actually, uh, well, maybe if any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Biju. In fact, you know, uh, you enhanced the uh, status of the, and the treatment of the migrant workmen uh, from the uh, uh, present perspective mm -hmm. or the perception we carry about the migrant workmen. Uh, now we'll go back quickly to, uh, uh, Mr. Binay, uh, Mr. Binay, you have already uh, uh, highlighted that there is no inadequacy of the availability of the labor laws or the constitutional provision. But even then, uh, you, you wanted to uh, speak about that probably if anything is going wrong, that is basically from the perspective of the ineffective implementation. Still, do you feel that there is any further scope to strengthen the provisions of the labor laws or even to think about amendment to the Indian constitution under Article 368? Over to you, Mr. Binay. Thank you, Mr. Mitra. As far as I take the last uh, uh, question from you, the first, as far as the amendment of the constitution of India is needed, uh, whether it is needed or not needed, it, to my mind, uh, the constitution of India have uh, sufficient provisions and safeguards to ensure uh, welfare of the my, uh, workers, including the migrant workers. And uh, if you see, as you mentioned, uh, the concurrent list, uh, the three entries, they cover e almost each and every uh, um, subject which will be of concern for the industry as well as for the work. But what, to, what we need to look at today is that when we think of labor laws, then uh, the, at the political level or at the uh, legislative level, the labor laws are 
enacted uh, keeping only one side of the coin in mind that is the labor we'll have to treat them as a composite unit namely the industry as one side and the labor uh, or the uh, 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 workers on the other side now we will have to take into consideration the needs and the uh, needs of the industry while ensuring that the lay workmen they are uh, given adequate wages that their conditions of living are ensured their health is ensured and their well being is ensured so today looking at the existing provisions what i feel that uh, there is a comprehensive legislation if at all is needed to make sure that uh, the benefit of esi leave pension or regulation of employment and other conditions of work for these workers who are not otherwise covered even by the uh, interstate migration act or the contract labor act secondly there was there, there is a need to ensure a parity between permanent contractors and the workers who are engaged through contract labors and uh, adequate uh, and the uh, a, a, an amendment to that extent is needed in the contract uh, labor act now the uh, we also need to identify informal sector map them we also need to uh, ensure that uh, in the interstate migrant labor not only the migrant labor who are coming through a contractor which is uh, included and the amend the language uh, the definition of migrant labor under section 21e of the interstate migrant labor act of 1979 will have to be amended to include even those migrant labor who are self initiated migrants which are not so far covered in any of the legislative enactment and if that is done then uh, uh, the amendment will certainly have uh, the their desired effect and we will be able to ensure not only the economic activity and not only the uh, the well being of the industry and the healthy environment working environment in the industry but also the demands of the labor thank you thank you so much mr vinay in fact uh, i am uh, on behalf of the nipm express our sincere thanks to all of our eminent speakers uh, one second sir uh, uh, mitra sir ek minute ek minute just for close let me be close there is a question ha it is quite informative and educative but not to make it more vibrant let's now go on to the participants questionnaire the questions they have raised and as for the structure dr shahu is expected to uh, yeah. take note of the key questions and then he will raise those questions before the concerned eminent speaker yes, so sir. now i will hand over uh, to dr shahu dr yeah, shahu thank you thank you sir uh, there is a question from mayuri dawale uh, mayuri ji i am unmuting you uh, uh, you will put this question her question is to uh professor biju barke and uh, dr yeah uh dr jay kumar mayuri ji are you there uh yes i'm there sorry i yeah. missed hearing you i had some internet trouble yeah yeah you you can put your question regarding your counseling and guest worker concept you like very much some questions yes. there yeah I had two questions actually. One was to understand if there is a, a database being maintained by any government machinery or organization on the exit and entry of workers, and uh, what skills they have, so that we can connect that the people who want the jobs who are left behind and still don't have jobs, and those who want, uh, you know, to to employ them. The second question is to do. Uh, to understand if there is any counseling being done for these migrant workers because in my little limited interaction i have seen that a lot of the um, the return has been based on the fear and the psychosis of corona so these are my two questions and if uh, the panelists could help me understand this better please thank you thank you who should i yeah professor biju yeah. or dr jay kumar from the industry perspective let me let me say then let professor come in uh, from the from the government perspective whether there is a database of 
a workman going out or coming i am not very sure but there is a interstate migrant workman where you are paying a license so each state knows how many people have been engaged so people the employer files the return and all those things so in fact if from there you can get a count but the skill level and other things i i am not sure whether uh, any other uh, agency like nsdc are counting but very recently i am seeing in papers that up government wants to uh, create a database of skill set in order to train and redeploy and think it is a very very noble initiative but as a corporate in lnd we engage more than 2 lakh uh, workmen across different project sites in india and abroad last two years back we went into a sphere of digitalization uh, uh, spread uh, spearheaded by uh, our ceo and md mr s n subramanian uh, we have mapped every workman based on their aadhar card we know the entire details of them and we know their what is the skill level and what is the type of training they have gone through what type of projects they have worked and we call it as a uberization of workman like there is an app where in case a project manager requires a particular type of workman he can put a message initially we started with the sending an sms to the workman but that coordination became difficult so our learning from the experience we moved to we can send an sms it will go to the all the contractors telling that this type of workman is required at this project site the contractor has to just call a particular number or even a miss call is sufficient so our concerned person will talk to them talk about the rates etc and then we try to mobilize the the workman back to that so we have a database which we started and which is because of our digital initiative okay uh, just let me add yes the database uh, uh, you know as of now i also don't know that a comprehensive database of this is of the skilled worker is, uh, is existing though there has been talks about it i understand mr manish might be sir might be the best person to talk about whether how do i create a skill database that later but one of the positive things is that if you're talking we, here we are actually talking about the migrant workers we are uh, talking about either through a contractor or self initiated we are not talking about the there is another set of categories which are actually called the attached to the migrant because along with the migrant there can be a plus 1 plus uh, half plus half which actually tag along okay not everybody keeps their family at uh, in home that is why the picture we see a lot of kids ex children etc also walking back so there is an attached uh, link migration also happening we don't have data about that but one of them some of the estimates says that look we should not forget that we are we should be proud about this we are a country with the highest tele telephone mobile phone density so if you are really looking at it in most probability every migrant workman will have a telephone cell phone connection or a sim card which actually means that there is a possibility to reach out if you are able to actually aggregate that and along with you know we have aadhar we have uh, mnregs schemes we have a lot of distributed databases somewhere down which we actually are able to integrate it i think we should be able to build some amount of database and that data would help us to create identity for this migrant unless we create that identity we are not going to solve this old problem as i read someone as selling is that we will keep on actually talking about old wine and new models but yes there are disparate data points which are available which needs to be uh, collated together and made into valuable information okay that's my yeah. no Thank adding you. to that adding Anything to else? that adding to that now every worker has to be paid through a bank account so yeah. if you want a bank account aadhar card is required so it is very easy to tag off today yeah Uh, anything uh, to be added, uh, Manish Kumar Sir, or that uh, regarding counseling centers uh, on migration? Yes, so on the on the first part about database, we have got a database which is Aadhaar verified, uh, which has telephone numbers, and it's about two crore people whom we have skilled. These are new in new uh, people who are getting into labor force who come to our training centers. We have about ten thousand of them, and uh, it's it's these numbers that we have captured over time. Uh, one of the challenges which we have found with that data is, you know, the the frequency with which people change the phone number, and uh, the, you often, you know, you go, I was told by one of the private sector person that a resume of a blue collar worker has a half life period of maybe three, you know six weeks. That's that's what he feels, you know. So therefore, the 
ability to contact him is quite difficult. And lately, we have been talking to some of the banks that can we use blockchain uh, to, you know, to in a way to continue tracking a person as they go up and progress in their career. Because the idea would be, uh, ideal way would be that we should be able to get a good sense of how is he progressing. Some of the analytics that we have done is to understand that when we skill someone and somebody is totally unskilled, so it's using this database, that does it make a difference in his wages? And we have found that it makes a difference of 15% if he is skilled and gets a job. And this is just three months, three months skilling. And the implication of this is that every rupee that the government spends, two rupee out of that in the long term actually goes to the labor and two rupees uh, goes, to, goes to the industry. So essentially it multiplies, that one rupee multiplies into you know, greater money, it becomes almost five and there are four and then is divided half half between the two. So that's the way we had looked at the social cost benefit of it. Coming to counseling, we do do we do counseling. Uh, that's but on skill related issues. I think counseling has been a big point in India. It requires tremendous amount of, uh, I think, push. Some of the technological solutions lately has been fantastic. There is, for example, a NAC, an app called NAC, K-N-A-C-K, which you can actually download in your app and you can play that game. It's a language agnostic game. Uh, it's, it's uh, conceptualized by a professor from Harvard and is being managed by one of our, one of the ex-staff of NSDC. And uh, the way it works is that you play that game for about 20 minutes. It decomposes your personality into 72 different traits and gives you a sense that what are the jobs for which you might be suitable? What are the jobs you might not be suitable? So, for example, if you go to healthcare, you must have high level of empathy. If you don't have very high level of empathy and you're going only because uh, there, there is money into that, then very soon you will find that it's not a work which you can do. So we are therefore now using such technological stuff as well as some of the psychometric uh, measures to, to advise uh, newcomers into what is the job that they should be taking. But this is a missing gap in India at the moment. And I think we need to do far much more on this one. Yes, sir. Thank you. I think, uh, sir, there is some one question. Uh, something is there to connect it with migrant workers. I do not know. Is there anything RPL program of NSDC? Is there any program planned to roll it out? Is it connected? If it is connected, then... Yeah, so, so recognition of prior learning is one of the most powerful, um, I think, uh, method by which we can skill India. And the, the outcome of that is also very powerful because our analytics shows that if you are, uh, if you are less educated, the benefit that occurs to you is the highest. And uh, we have even identified what, what is that level of benefit which comes to you. Because I, since we sit on tons of data and we, we keep on doing data analysis using best of uh, brains from across the world. So, uh, so I think with the RPL part, uh, while we, NSDC has been doing quite a bit, but it requires a lot of co coordination with uh, the private sector and both organized and unorganized private sector. Because in India, it's almost 35 crore people who are skilled but don't have... Uh, certification and that's a very huge number it's not something which you can achieve uh, by just one agency it requires many agencies to be working on it so okay. something on this government has put in quite a bit of money but uh, I think the scale uh, of operation requires a very different uh, level of I think conceptualization now yes sir so uh, there is uh, a question from Mr. S. Dean Dayal and actually not a question he thinks about uh, just to be human centric and building capacity, capability centric, then doling out. So, Mr. Dean Dalen, uh, are you there? Yeah. yeah. Mr. Dean? You have to be unmuted. Yeah, I have unmuted. One second. Uh, is the CEO of Center of Excellence, Bangalore. Just a second, I am trying uh, some problem. Okay, so uh, yeah, Mr. Dean. Yeah, no, I think it's a brilliant discourse. The whole focus is I think we have to be human centric than billable centric. And when you are talking about contract and we are talking about various other issues, we have somewhere forgotten the human centric city and the native intelligence. Going beyond certification is the native intelligence. And there's something which we have not exploited. There's a tremendous opportunity. And uh, uh, going back to the roots is going to be the important thing. The dignity part is the missing link. So I think um, yeah. Mr. Din Dayalan has made a very important point. Um, the, the, the discourse of uh, skilling most, mostly has been 
productivity centric for a long time. And I think there is a need for making it human centric also. I mean, I'm not saying productivity centric should go away, but the human centric has to come in. That is very, very critical. And the, the need for that is very visible in the current times when you are trying to localize things. So what I mean by this is at the moment when we plan a skilling, we are always looking towards an industry whose productivity will increase and therefore linking it to employment. But a human centric one looks at capabilities of individual is, is basically what uh, you know, economists like Mr. Amartya Sen and others have, uh, have been uh, speaking for a long time that can we begin to think of, uh, you know, focusing on the human capabilities uh, rather than purely the productivity part of it. And uh, that becomes critical when we begin to say that uh, skills should become local and say skills should become, you know, uh, look at the livelihood part of an individual. So I think I'm for human centric approach. It, it's a big change which is necessary at the policy level. I think since we are discussing policy, uh, this is something which people need to advocate a little more stronger uh, because it means a lot to India. And these are not antagonistic. They actually, there is a point at which they converge. So therefore we did not treat it as being you know, antagonistic. They are just so suitable for different parts and different aspects of India. So, so I think we need to promote both. Uh, thank you, sir. There is uh, another question from Mr. Mohammad Ilyas. Mr. Mohammad Ilyas, are you there? It is to Mr. Vinay Garg. Uh, regarding some changes, uh, state governments have changed their uh, law and law. Mr. Ilyas, are you there? Mr. Mohammad Ilyas? No, I think uh, he's not there. His question is, sir, recently some state governments were started insisting to get approval from them for employing interested migrant worker from the concerned state. How much, uh, how it is possible, Mr. Vinay Garg? Garsa. Uh, as regards uh, taking concurrence from particular state to um, for migration of workers from one state to another state, the Interstate Migration Act already deals with this provision and there is a provision and then registration, essentially registration is required in the Doni state and the uh, it has to be reported by the industry who is engaging the migrant worker in the donor district but the difficulty remains that we have apart from these workers who are uh, coming through a contractor so registered in the one state to another we have large number of workers who are self-initiated migra migrants as uh, professor Barki pointed out and for these, there is no, uh, as on today, there is no legislative framework for registration of these and uh, for any, any legislative framework in any of the state which could control this. Recently, the state of UP has come out with, with an idea that they are constituting a board or a commission where, you know, everybody will be registered and wherever uh, uh, a migration uh, of such a worker skilled, semi-skilled or unskilled takes place from the state of UP to any other state, then that data and that uh, will be available with the state also. But yes, for uh, migration through contractor, it is available. That legal framework is available under Interstate Migration Act of 79. Otherwise, uh, the state, yes, they have done. This uh, state of UP has done it. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, there is a question from Mr. Kalyan Power to Dr. C. J. Kumar, sir. Uh, Mr. Kalyan, are you there? I am trying to unmute if it is possible. Otherwise, I will read the question. Sometimes technical problem. Uh, huh, Mr. Kalyan Kumar, are you there? Uh, Kalyan Power, are you there? Mr. Kalyan Power. No. So uh, his question is uh, to Dr. Jai Kumar, what are the ways and means you foresee to bring back the migrants and uh, what could be the great motivation for them apart from social security? What can be done? Dr. Jai Kumar. See, we are looking at various ways of doing it. One is the traditional way of we have HR for workmen at a position in each of the independent companies. So we have identified people <clears throat> who are in north, south, east, west, and every location to 
contact manually the contractors with their mobile numbers etc and talk to them regarding the work scope of work nearer to that location and see how we can mobilize that's a traditional way of doing next is as i said we have that app into which we do we a contact all our subcontractors regarding the scope of work etc to bring them back third is uh, the the uh, uh, we have a construction skills training institute 14 institutes across the country in tied up with various uh, 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 trades around 14 trades it is there and um, uh, through those construction skills training institutes we are trying to get them back so most of us who has left us is not because of the the payment of wages nor because of uh, the, any other uh, 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 concerns because of employment they have left because of the emotional pressure as well as the uh, the, uh, the the apprehensions about the corona and other things once that apprehensions are over and they definitely they will come back for work and so we it again depends upon how a timely payment of wages and how timely you you uh, take care of their health welfare safety etc so getting them back is only because of this fear so once that is over definitely we are very confident of coming and as i earlier said it is not that all of them have left around 20 to 60 percent of them are still working with us and they are with us okay sir thank you different, uh, different methods yeah thank you sir so there is another uh, question from mr yeswan chawan uh, mr chawan are you there uh, yes, sir. I'm yeah, it is well, a question to Manish Kumar, sir. And yeah, please go on. Yeah. Very brief. Very, very, yeah, th thank you for uh, the option, sir. Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it was a great session and a lot of information uh, was shared. Uh, my question to the panel uh, panelists is uh, uh, that, you know, as for the latest estimates of international labor organization, out of a total of 300 crore people at large, almost 160 crore people will are at a risk of either losing their jobs or are at a risk of you know facing a severe wage cut uh, further uh, given the context of cmi's report uh, the latest report which says that uh, with the uh, alarming levels of unemployment and in just april alone we had a job loss of 12 crore people you know uh, in april itself so given this context you know uh, how do we foresee the policy measures to uh, ensure the purchasing power of these individual through policy interventions and continue with the demand generation and thereof with the business continuity, yeah, uh, which is very critical for employing these people right. in right. the right. future. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So I think uh, um, you know there is a very important trend which is happening across the world, and I think the answer probably lies in that. Uh, if you look at the rate of return to capital and rate of return to labor, and you track it from 1920 onwards, you'll find that both of them grew uh, almost equally. So basically meaning that the, the, the firm makes profit and then it shares part of the profit with labor, so the labor wages also increases. So that's the kind of trend which continued. There is a sharp di the diversion which occurs in 1990, where suddenly you'll find the rate of return to capital is actually exponentially going upwards and the rate of return to labor becomes flatter and then even begins to fall you know so there is this uh, divergence which is occurring and this is this is a i think a civilizational issue in the sense that after we have had the internet and the technological power that it has brought us and and the fact that we are still you know experimenting with new technology we have not stabilized yet there's a lot of changes which keeps occurring so you'll find that industry puts in a lot of money back whatever they might have earned actually puts it back. So LNT as it might have been in the 1990s is not what it is today. You have Visa, you know, the, the app which you are talking of, uh, Dr. Jay Kumar, and that's a very powerful uh, app which they have developed, you know, which we, we see potential for the entire country, actually, the kind of app they have developed. So when you put money there, and then the money which you could have distributed to labor, you did not, essentially it implies that we have to, as a society, think whether we should move towards universal basic income for the lowest income quartile that I was talking of. And that's that's a policy level thinking, which, which is necessary in the world today. And it's nothing to do just with India. It's a structural issue. I think it's a technological issue. And it's a very human issue. And uh, I think we, we need to consider that. How does one identify the lowest income quartile? That's a big challenge. I mean, Professor Barki will know that it's not easy to identify people once we, be, once we create policies. So therefore, as a thought, that might be a good one to reflect on. 
uh, in reality, how we work all of these things out and whether this will be acceptable. You know, a lot of countries have experimented, some, some have had a mixed kind of experience with it. But this is a thought process which is going on globally and for India, given the current experience, it shows that this might be necessary for us to think even deeper. Uh, so that's my answer to your question. Yes, sir. I think uh, another question, Mr. Vittal K. Rao is not there. Uh, but his question was uh, to Manish Kumar Shah, you are suggesting all long-term plans, but there is a need to take immediate short-term plan. What could it be uh, as regards complying strictly to the Interstate uh, Migration Workers Act and other uh, Building Construction Act? Uh, a short-term plan is required immediately for the uh, uh, taking care of the plight of the migrants. Yeah, so for the immediate term, if you see the district collectors have been active in almost all areas where people have gone back. The fact that we have data of all these 90 districts, we have exact number of people who have gone back and that keeps on changing on daily basis because they are accounted for. But the fact that they're given a ration out there, I mean, there is uh, you no know, free uh, grains which is provided to them. So there's a lot of uh, short term uh, activities which is happening. But I think that is just to keep them, uh, keep them, you know, in a way safe and healthy for the moment. But uh, the economic activity, which uh, which is what perhaps you know I was talking of, uh, will, would be somewhere in medium term. So I think to that you'll get you'll have to get organized. If you don't get yourself organized and do do it in an ad hoc manner, it'll probably uh, not you know not be very beneficial. So it's, it's something which might happen in maybe let's say six months time, and the immediate one which probably he's speaking of is already happening. Yeah, thank you, sir. I think uh, there is uh, Mr. Ian Dharma is executive director uh, NTPC. He has a uh, certain uh, point to uh, ask if we, I can unmute. Uh, okay, we're not able to unmute. Uh, we move on to uh, one question from. Mr. Shirodeep. Shirodeep, yes. His question is to Professor. Sorry, just muted. And, uh, yeah. Mr. Shirodeep Rai. Mr. Shirodeep Rai, are you there? No, he's not there. His question is. Uh, what initiatives are being taken by government to create a safety net or a safety net can be created for migrant workers and their families? Uh, Professor Vijumarke uh, uh, and uh, Manish Kumar, sir. Okay, uh, well, you know, in fact, uh, safety net is actually a very interesting thing. And unfortunately, you know, I'm also against out any doles for it. And people actually say that, look, you know, you need to throw bad money or do you need to throw money and create and the thing, you know, there are certain, certain governments like, for example, Sri Kumar had typed it that what the government of Kerala has done, different states have done in terms of creating the social security, but it's not actually so the same because sometimes, you know, that can actually become the problem. Right? But it's not that we don't have that solution. Okay. I'm sure Dr. Jay Kumar and the people in construction labor, construction sector know we have the construction workers welfare home. Yeah. Think about uh, the money which has been what you call lying there unspent. Okay. So what happens is that you know we have a mechanism called this old labor welfare boards, which are in a way trying to help it to create this thing and provide statutory what you call the social security. The system is there, but unfortunately, what happens is that look, it kind of, we have money, but we don't use it. <laughs> Sorry to say that. Okay. So, you know, it's actually not to create one more institution and create a white elephant, but it's actually think about the good. And I can again go back to two states, Orissa and partly Kerala, where some of the wage boards are doing extremely good work. And if we can strengthen that, that institutions, that actually would be, uh, you know, a good solution. Yeah. Professor, Professor, and Professor, and Professor Kahu, Professor yeah. excuse me. I have a you know, small clarification from 
uh, professor because many of these suggestions are pouring in one of the suggestions that what professor talked about the collaborative approach they are talking about that social workers or the ngos yeah. they can also play very meaningful role to mitigate the hardship of the you know the migrant workers professor how do you look at it okay yeah in fact what happens is that now the future is actually about collaboration uh, okay partnering okay and also using technology okay how do you use both technology and the social partners to really help your work that does not actually mean that you are outsourcing all the work which you should do to an ngo okay <laughs> you know if you are the partnering you you uh, might be able to and i know this is nipm and this thing is that look you know i have been trained in industrial relations traditions in kerala we had a very very wonderful institution on paper called trade unions which helped us to partner okay those who have managed trade unions well actually know that they can be very good social in fact that is why the social term for it is called social partner okay so once some of the social partner institutions have gone down because of their own fault and because of what you call systemic larger systemic issues okay we we also need to be careful about what happens is that bringing in possibly ngos etc but yes they do have a role to actually play in that yeah anything uh, anything to I, be at anything to be added by manish kumar sir Oh, no, I'm fine. I think yeah. we, we addressed it quite okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Varma, Varma, this is uh, Ayn Varma. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. I have been unmuted. Yeah, I'm uh, EDHR in NTPC, and I was uh, listening to the uh, very uh, carefully to the all the panel members. It was a very interesting uh, subject, and uh, the takeaways are very high. Uh, but just wanted to share that uh, in NTPC, we have developed a system called uh, Contract Labor Information Management System, uh, whereby we track. and uh, keep record of each and every uh, contractor workers uh, to the tune of 115000 and uh, you know, we have uh, somebody was asking the question about are we maintaining a record so uh, uh, from public sector side i can say that ntpc has introduced this kind of system uh, about 2 uh, years back and it's paying very rich dividends first uh, it is mapping the complete uh, attendance records and all the wage payments are done through the automated uh, wage sheet generated through the climps system and also all the contract labor compliances are being done through this system right uh, I, i was hearing uh, uh, to mr manish kumar about the skill development we have already introduced a concept called competency certification for these uh, contractors workers in many of our uh, niche areas okay. uh, through the help of uh, power sector skill council and also right. through cbip and okay. uh, in our company we have taken uh, this this uh, initiative of skilling the uh, contractor laborers in a very very significant manner and i think uh, uh, this this uh, concept needs to be replicated in all by all the public sector and private sector employers because the concept of uh, contractor workers or contractor labor is going to stay in our country for uh, many times to come but Thank one uh, uh, crucial aspect that i wanted to have attraction uh, attention of uh see we were uh, uh, we are working in a uh, i mean uh, essential service and we were mandated to produce the electricity during the covid times so uh, some of the uh, contractor workers were mandated to perform the duty but there was no uh, system of having uh, insurance uh, by the government we had taken up the matter with the labor ministry and with the through dg scope uh, so that i think uh, is is one of the major uh, incentive for the Uh, or this uh, i mean uh, for the satisfaction of the contractor workers that they are going to be taken care and the other aspect which has been discussed is how to bring back the workers who have gone back home like uh, mr jay kumar was telling about uh, 40% uh, construction workers have gone back uh, our estimate is also to that extent because as of now out of uh, 35000 odd uh, workers who are engaged in the construction and erection works in ntpc okay. uh, about 25 20000 have gone back and the major challenge is how to bring them back yeah what thank you sir I, uh, yeah. so these are the challenging points uh, that i think on this uh, would our uh, panel say uh, to reflect on it sir manish kumar sir 
Yeah, on which specific aspect? I mean, do you want my response? He, he, in any specific? Yeah, yeah. He, he talked about, you know, uh, last uh, part. Uh, that yeah, how, to bring the, how to bring back the migrant, you know, the, migrant yeah. worker. Yeah. Migrant. yeah. So so that's, I think, uh, you know, we I mentioned about the skill management information system, which we have developed. Yeah. It's a demand and supply based uh, platform. And uh, it, it has inputs on the demand side. For example, uh, there has been demands, you know, from certain groups in Chennai lately, and that, that data is entered into the SMIS, and then it maps that given the skill sets which is needed for that particular job, which are the nearest people that you can access who might be there from the supply side. So we are enriching our supply data along with the demand data. We are also talking to some of the companies like Quest Corps. Uh, we are talking to Urban Claps because there are lots of Indians working abroad in UAE who are returning back. And we want to ensure that they're, they're, uh, they, they also get a job which uh, satisfies them. So making that connection with uh, companies which might be interested in their skill set. So I think that's, that's the market uh, maker role that we play by uh, connecting the demand and supply. That's, that's the way I think we can work it out in the long term. Uh, just now we completed two hours, sir. Uh, yes. Really, I, uh, NIPM is grateful. Uh, we'll, we'll come to an end now. Uh, such a wonderful session. We'd like to continue this this uh, this kind of interactions uh, anyway. But the time constraint is always there. Time is the resource uh, which we, we need to utilize. And uh, uh, now the time uh, to express our uh, gratitude. Uh, we are uh, grateful. From our core of our heart, NIPM is grateful to such a highly eminent uh, panelist, Dr. Manish Kumar Saab, Dr. Jay Kumar Saab, Professor Biju Varke, Mr. Vinayagar, Dr. S. V. Mitra, wonderfully handling, uh, moderating the questions. And really, because it's such a wonder, such a vast area and such a difficult area, and everything has been streamlined and good. AKV is there, I think, uh, uh, on, on behalf of uh, participants, I can say, a great learning also. So we are grateful to you, sir. We, we don't have a word to express our gratitude to all the uh, highly eminent uh, analysts. We need your blessings in coming days also, so that this is a platform where we try to eminate the, uh, your ideas to the participants and they implement it, thereby our country becomes stronger. Uh, then we are uh, again. I'm expressing on behalf of an IPM uh, our thanks. We are grateful to our participants. Uh, a good number. It touched 252 at one point of time, and uh, the any knowledge sharing platform becomes effective if the participants are there, and we try to make it uh, more vibrant. And that has been uh, the niche of uh, NIPM. We try to put the people directly to the panelists and uh, uh, next uh, pla uh, next week we are planning for an international web meeting we don't call nowadays webinar because you know it becomes monotony one sided it's a web meeting and you put your questions from uh, in advance and we try to accommodate that so that it becomes more vibrant we are thankful to uh, our uh, honorable national president he has been the guiding force and uh, uh, I am thankful to Mr. Anish, he is our uh, secretary of uh, Kerala chapter. He has been uh, providing support uh, in this and my IT cell of NIPM all star. We are grateful to all of you. See you in the next international web seminar, uh, web, web meeting next week. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks thank you. to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, NIPM and uh, everyone. Uh, was really a great learning for me also. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hearing you. directly from the industry leaders as well as from Subhaki. And uh, thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, NIPM and everybody. Thank you. Thank you, sir.